There was two kinds of slaves. There was the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro, they lived in the house with master. They dressed pretty good. They ate good because they ate his food. But he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro said, yeah, we got a good house here. Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. If the master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you came to the house Negro and said, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, that house Negro would look at you and say, man, you crazy. What you mean separate? Where is there a better house than this? Where can I wear better clothes than this? Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call him today because we still got some house niggers running around here. <laughs> this modern house negro loves his master. He wants to live near him. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near his master. And then brag about, I'm the only Negro out here. <laughs> I'm the only one on my job. I'm the only one in this school. You're nothing but a house Negro. And if someone come to you right now and say, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What you mean, separate? From America? This good white man? Where are you going to get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I, I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why, well, you left your mind in Africa. <laughs> On that same plantation, there was the field Negro. The field Negro, those were the masses. There was always more Negroes in the field than there was Negroes in the house. The Negro in the field caught hell. He ate leftovers. In the house, they ate high up on the hull. The Negro in the field didn't get nothing but what was left of the insides of the hull. They call them chitlins nowadays. In those days, they call them what they were. Guts. That's what you were, a gut eater. And some of you are all still gut eaters. The field Negro was beaten from morning till night. He lived in a shack, in a hut. He wore all cast off clothes. And he hated his master. I say he hated his master. He was intelligent. That house Negro loved his master. But that field Negro, remember, they were in the majority. And they hated his master. When the house caught on fire, he didn't try and put it out. That field Negro prayed for a wind. <laughs> for a breeze. When the master got sick, the field Negro prayed that he died. If someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here.
You got field Negroes in America today. I'm a field Negro. The masses are the field Negroes. When they see this man's house on fire, you don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They say the government is in trouble. Imagine a Negro. Our government. I even heard one say our astronauts. They won't even let him near the plant. And our astronauts. Our Navy. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. Just as the slave master in that day used Tom, the house Negro, to keep the field Negroes in check. The same old slave master today has Negroes who are nothing but modern Uncle Toms, 20th century Uncle Toms, to keep you and me in check, keep us under control, keep us passive and peaceful and nonviolent. That's Tom making you nonviolent. It's like when you go to the dentist and the man is going to take your tooth. You're going to fight him when he starts pulling. So they squirt some stuff in your jaw called Novocaine to make you think they're not doing anything to you. <laughs> so you sit there and because you got all that Novocaine in your jaw, you suffer peacefully. <laughs> There's nothing in our book, the Koran, as you call it, Koran, teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send them to the cemetery. That's a good religion. In fact, that's that all-time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a head for a head, and a life for a life. That's a good religion. And then anybody, no one, resents that kind of religion being taught but a wolf who intends to make you his meal. This is the way it is with the white man in America. He's a wolf, and you a sheep. Anytime a shepherd, a pastor, teach you and me not to run from the white man, and at the same time teaches don't fight the white man, he's a traitor to you and me. Don't lay down our life all by itself. No. Preserve your life. It's the best thing you got. And if you got to give it up, let it be even Stephen. Hey.